Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? It's a little, you know, cloudy outside. The sun's not shining, but we're still happy and everything in here. You guys look great. Um, I'm going to, I want to start off with a question for you guys. Have you guys ever went through the trouble of planning like an event or an outing or something and just planned it to every extravagant de- detail that you possibly could. You've planned everything out. You've crossed your T's, dotted your I's. You know what you're doing, when you're doing it, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. You've gone in. Some of you guys are super, super big planners. You go into all of the details of all of this events to make sure that it is absolutely perfect just to have it all go haywire. <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, when I try to drive to church this morning with my kids. <laughs> I, when I was about 14 years old uh, in our youth group, uh, we went on a hiking trip in the middle of the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania mountains. It's a three-day, 40-mile hiking trip with probably about 30 teenagers. Um, and if you've ever worked with teenagers before, you know that if you ever run an event like that, there has to be some serious planning that goes involved because moms don't want their kids eaten by bears. I don't know why that is, but it's not a good thing. So we went into meticulously planning on how this event was going to go, and I remember our leaders were extremely extremely clear and extremely strict on what was going to happen on this trip. We knew exactly where we were going to be sleeping, where we were taking our rest stops, what was for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We knew exactly what path to follow. We knew exactly what time we should be here and what time we should be there. We knew everything down to a detail. If somebody got lost, we had a plan for that. If somebody got bit by a rattlesnake, we had a plan for that, which never happened. But everything we had to absolute detail. So we go on this trip, and we start, and I'm about 14 years old, so I'm pretty tiny. I'm pretty tiny now, but I was smaller then. (laughs) Can you believe it? I know. (laughs) I was pretty small, and if you've ever been on one of these hiking trips, you know you carry everything on your back, your clothes, your tent, your food, everything gets carried on your back. So we're going through this trip, and we're just walking our way hours on end, and the first day goes great. I, you know, I'm pretty exhausted because of carrying all my stuff, but other than that, everything went great. We're bonding with each other. We're out in nature. It was great. Second day, we wake up and we start off early in the morning. And we start our path down our orange trail. We have to be following these orange markers. So we go down this path. And we're probably about mid, mid-morning, probably 10 or 11 in the morning. And all of a sudden, the path goes into this clearing. And there's hundreds upon hundreds of trees that have just fallen down over the path. It looked like the Hulk and Optimus Prime like had a death match and they're just going at it or like a tornado came through this place. Hundreds and hundreds of trees just falling down over the path and this went on for probably about 300 yards. All of these trees falling over and like forward is the only way to go. We can't turn back. So we got to climb over all of these trees. We're jumping over the trees. We're climbing under them. We got these big old packs on our back and like we're getting snagged by twigs and branches and we're walking through. Sometimes we would lose our way because the trees had the orange markers on them and they were all falling down. So we're like looking under branches to see if we can find the orange markers, and we have to climb over all of these trees, and finally, our entire team gets over the trees and to the other side, and we're like, okay, that, that was terrible, but no big deal. We're going to keep going. Like, this is not going to ruin our, our trip, so we keep going, and probably about 10 minutes later, we're walking, and the path becomes extremely narrow. It becomes very narrow, and we start walking single file line, one after the other, probably a few feet space in between each other. And we're walking, and all of a sudden this kid, his name was Scott, he, he was about 20 feet in front of me, a few people ahead of me. He turns around and stops and yells back, watch out for the bee's nest. And we're like, what? Okay. He's like, so we stop. Everyone stops. I stop. Like, I'm not about that. Like, I don't like bees. I don't like getting stung. I don't like, I don't like insects. So I stop. And immediately I start looking around. I'm like, where's this bee's nest? Because I don't want to step in. I don't want to hit it or anything. So I stop. I'm looking around, and I'm like, What's he talking about? There's no bees nest. I was like, Scott's crazy. Like, there's, there's no bees nest. And I'm about ready to start walking again. And then out of my left ear, I hear this buzzing noise. And I stop, and I'm like, oh, no. And then I start to turn slowly, and I look down, and I start feeling this crawling on my leg. And I'm like, dear Jesus, no. And I look down, and I'm not, this is no exaggeration, hundreds and hundreds of bees crawling around my feet and starting to crawl up my legs. And in this moment, you have two options. Number one, you very, very carefully walk out of the bee's nest and carefully peel off the bees, kind of brush them off as carefully as possible. Option number two, you jump out of there and you scream like a little baby for all it's worth. I chose the latter option. (laughs) 
So I jumped out, and it's like they smelled fear. The moment I jumped out of that bee's nest, the hive exploded, and bees just went sent everywhere, all over the place, and they just attacked me. So the first thing that came to my mind, it's like, I just got to run. So I just book it, just down the path. I'm like, ah, just going as fast as I can. I'm 14, and I'm terrified, and these bees are clinging onto me. I remember they were clinging onto the, the tips of my fingers, and I, would, I was trying to, like, shake them off as they're stinging me and clinging onto my fingers, and they're just attacking me, and I'm running for all it's worth as I'm being stung over and over and over and over and over again, and the more I freaked out, the more I made a panic, the more they would attack and more of them would come. And I, I remember I just feeling absolutely terrified and these bees were just attacking and stinging me over and over again. I couldn't get them off. I'm trying to slap them off. I took my shirt off even. I even took my little canteen and like dumped it all over my head. It didn't work. And I just kept running and running. And my sister was actually on this trip with me, and she noticed that I was in trouble. She was a little bit ahead of me. She noticed that I was in trouble, and she runs back. And she starts to pick the bees off of me with her bare hands. I'm like, oh, Lord. So she comes up and starts grabbing the bees. And then more and more kids started coming after me. They started beating me with water bottles like, bam, 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 just over and over again. I'm like, you're not helping. Stop. And I'm screaming and crying as these bees over and over again are stinging me. This, half, this lasted probably for like a half hour of me just being stung over and over again, all of these bees. Finally, they were able to get me to like calm down. And once I calmed down, the bees kind of calmed down. <laughs> Easy to say that then in hindsight. Like, just calm down. You'll be okay. It's like, no. Like, people say all the time, Bees are more afraid of you than, uh, than you are of them. Like, no, that's not true. They're crazy. They'll just kill you. <laughs> so I'm like, so I finally calm down. I get the bees to stop. I'm in tears. I have welts all over me. I'm sore. I have bruises all over me. It was absolutely terrible. And we get to the other side of this, this path. And I, I remember now thinking back and looking at that. We planned our entire trip to, ask, to an exact detail. Everything we planned out. We knew what was coming. We knew what would happen. But nothing could have prepared us for this. We knew exactly how we wanted this trip to happen. We knew exactly how this should have gone. And this was definitely not part of it. We're going to look at a, a story of a man. His name is Naaman. And Naaman had everything planned out in his life. He knew what he wanted, he knew where he wanted, he knew how he wanted it. He had everything planned out, and he even had a plan of how he thought God would work in his life. And in this, this is found in 2 Kings chapter 5, and in this backstory, a little backstory of Naaman, Naaman, it describes him as a well-respected, high-favored man. He was a great man. That's how they describe him in this passage. He was someone who held authority. He was a commander of the army of the king of Syria. And he was successful at what he did. He was good at what he did. He won many, it says he won many, many, many victories over and over again. And he was good at what he did. And he was somebody who held a position of power, someone to be looked up to, to be respected, to aspire to. But Naaman had one problem. Naaman was diagnosed with leprosy. That dang leprosy, man. <laughs> Always gets those people in the Bible. I don't know what it is. Naaman was diagnosed with leprosy. And as you can imagine, the devastation that came with that. And not only the devastation, but the embarrassment, the rejection from the people he loved. Because in those times, there was no cure for leprosy. And if you had leprosy, you were to be exiled from your community and distanced from everybody that you love. So not only was the devastation of the death penalty that was just put upon you, but the embarrassment and the rejection of what was to come because leprosy, it attacked the nerves of your skin, eventually your organs, which would lead to a slow and painful death. However, Naaman being the great man that he was, he said he needed to find something, at least something to make it better. He needed to find some way to heal himself from this leprosy. So in his household, Naaman had an Israelite servant girl who knew of a prophet in the nation of Israel that could heal Naaman from this disease. So Naaman got all of his riches, he got all of his chariots and his horses, and he even got a letter from his own king of Syria, and he went to Israel, and he went straight to the king of Israel and says, can you heal me from this disease? And when the king heard the request, the king of Israel says, Am I God 
to kill and to make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy, and he tore his robes, and he was upset. And when Elisha found out what, what the king was doing, he sent word to the king of Israel and said, send Naaman to me, the prophet of Israel. And this is where we pick up. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. It says, So Naaman went with his horses and his chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, even better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So Naaman approaches Elisha's house. And it says he approaches his house with a grand parade of chariots and horses and riches and a a ton of people around him. Because if he was going to be healed by the prophet in Israel, he was going to do it his way. He was going to be respected as he did it. And he wanted to show Elisha he had something that he could offer him. He was of importance. And it was worth his time to heal him. So Naaman goes up to the door, and he stands in front of the house of Elisha, and he requests for Elisha. And I find this part extremely funny, actually. I find this part really funny because it says that when he went up to the door, Elisha didn't even go to meet him. He sent a messenger to go meet Naaman. And, like, I I can just, and I'm sure this didn't sit well with Naaman. Like, he didn't even meet him himself. And I can just picture at this moment maybe Elisha sitting at home on the couch with a bag of potato chips, and he's just sitting there, and the messenger comes up to him and says, hey, Naaman, there's some dude at the door for you. And Elisha's like, not now. This is us, is on, and I can't miss it. And it's live. And he's like, no, I can't. I can't go. And maybe he's, like, in tears because anyone who ever watches This Is Us is in tears, like, all the time. So he's like, no, don't see me like this, messenger. So he's, like, crying. He's like, just go tell him, like, go bathe in the Jordan River, like, seven times or something, and you'll be fine. Like, and so the messenger goes, and he relays the message back to Naaman, and he tells Naaman, go bathe yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman once goes away in a rage. He's angry. I'm sure he's angry because Elisha didn't go to meet him. But he's angry at the way that Elisha told him to be healed. He says, I thought he would just come out. I I was picturing him coming out, just weaving his hand, maybe doing a little bit of magic, light some candles or something like that, and then I would be healed. Like I thought this was a quick five-minute thing, then I'm on my way and I'm good. And he says, besides, there's so many better rivers than the Jordan River. Couldn't I go into that river instead? Like, why do we have to, the the Jordan Jordan River is nasty. Like, it's got algae and dirty and stuff like that. Like, can't I go in, like, some clean river or something like that? And he goes away. He leaves Elisha's house without being healed. Without being healed. And this seems pretty extreme, right? This seems pretty extreme, and sometimes, in some cases, seems unrelatable. I hope nobody in here has ever had leprosy before. That's not really a common thing, you know, at least in our culture today. It's not a common thing to have leprosy. And it seems almost extreme and unrelatable. But let me, let me ask us this question. How often do we go to God with our list of expectations and the way he's supposed to fill them and say, God, I need you to do this, this, and this, and this, and this way at this time and this moment for me? How often do we come to God with our dreams and our our aspirations, the things we want to fulfill in life, say, God, I need you to do these things for me. I need you to come forward. I need you to take care of this for me. Maybe how often do we come to God with our marriages, our finances, our families, even our ministries, and we bring them before God, all really great things, and we use that and we say, hey, Lord, I need you to complete this. In a year from now, I want to be here. In two years from now, I want to be here. And certainly, I don't want to be back farther from where I am now. And we bring these things forward to God and say, God, I need you to accomplish these things in this way, in this time. Lord, fulfill this for me. 
Or maybe sometimes we come to God and we bring all of our chariots and our riches and our, our gold and we come to God and say, look how much I have to offer you, God. Look how much I can do for you. I bring my family to the church for years, week after week. I'm in my Bible. I'm praying. I'm, I'm loving people. I'm being generous with my money. And we say, God, look at all these things that I have done for you. And we try to use that as a barter. And we say, God, I will do this, 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 this for you. And you will do this, 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 and this for me. And then not only when, when God doesn't answer, he doesn't fulfill those things in our life, not only are we upset that we didn't get what we want, but we become frustrated because he didn't hold up his end of the deal. And I have to imagine that Naaman, when, he, or when Elisha sees Naaman, he sees all of these things in him. He sees his riches, his power, his status, he sees how highly he thinks of himself. And he says to him, Naaman, if you want to be healed, I need you to go to the Jordan River and bathe yourself in it, not just once, but seven times. Why? Why did he ask him to do that? I think it's important to know that a life lived with God's power requires a heart surrendered to God's will. A life lived with God's power requires a heart surrendered to God's will. Na Naaman was never going to see the power of God displayed in his life until he humbled himself and gave control back into God's hands. We will never see the power of God displayed in our lives until we release control back into God's hands. A life with, with God's power requires a heart surrendered to God. So let me ask you, what are the areas in your life that you're meticulously planning? <laughs> that, you're, that you're expecting God to fulfill everything exactly the way that you thought it up to be. And even good things like, God, I want to be this in my ministry. I want to be this with my family and my parenting. This is where I want to be. Where are you planning those things in your life? Or what areas in your life are you expecting God to do something for you because of all the things that you have done for him? You said, look how much I have to offer you. Look what I've done for you, God. The least you could do is repay me back. Whether we think that consciously or subconsciously, what are the areas in our life we expect God to do something for us because we have done something in return for him? And let me tell you, a life lived with God's power requires a heart humbled to God's will, surrendered to God's will. And here's what I know. We cannot afford to live without the power of God. We cannot afford to live our lives without the grace of God. The need is too great. The forgiveness we need is too strong. The direction and wisdom in our lives is too great. We cannot afford, most of you guys probably know this already, we cannot afford to live without the power of God in our lives. And it says when, when Naaman's friends found out, his servants found out that he, that he did not, that he re, uh, declined Elisha's offer, they went up to him like, are you crazy? Like, this is your one shot, dude. Like, you have leprosy. You don't have any other options, Naaman. Like, it's either you, you go humble yourself, you go take a bath in a nasty river, or you die of leprosy. Like, you don't have any other options. And they go up to him and they beg him like, dude, like, Get it together. Just go back and listen to him and do what he says. And, and this is what it says uh, in verse 13. It says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. So Naaman decided to go back and do what Elisha said, and he bathed in the Jordan seven times. This is once he came out of the water, his, he was clean, he was healed from the disease, and his flesh was restored. Now, back in those days, there was no cure for leprosy. If you had leprosy, it was pretty much a death sentence for you. However, today, apparently, if you had leprosy, 
if you have the misfortune of, of having leprosy, there, there is a, uh, some type of treatment or cure for it today. So it's kind of interesting about that. Like, so if somebody got leprosy, what would that look like? So I Googled it, and everything on the internet is true, and I found this, I found this website called scienceordic.com, which sounded really smart, so I'm pretty sure this is going to be accurate. It says, if the disease is not treated with antibiotics, it could be fatal. It says, medical treatment stops the disease and removes the infection, but it does not repair the damage. It stops the disease, removes the infection, but it does not repair the damage. So in a realistic view for Naaman, even if Elisha could do something for him, even if there was a cure to stop his disease, he knew if he could be clean from this disease, he knew that he would never be back to the way he was before. There was no going back. He was never going to be 100%. He still had to deal with the after fact or the aftermath of what happened to his body. There was no going back to 100% before, even if there was a cure. But verse 14 says this, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Not only was he cured from the disease, but he was given brand new skin like that of a child. Let me, let me, let me tell you this. God is not in the business of just stopping the damage. He's not in the business of just limiting the chaos in your life. God is in the process of making all things new. So let me ask you, what is the sin in your life or the guilt in your life that you walk with with on a daily basis? And you have all this sadness and this, this guilt of the things that, ha- that you have done in your past. And so you try to work your way and you say, you know, if I just did enough things, maybe I could feel better about what I did in my past or the things that I've done in my future. You know, if I just did enough great things for God, then maybe I could feel better about those things. So we, you know, we try to pile up these deeds or that barter and say, if I could do that, I could feel better about myself. Or maybe you're at the point where you think, you know, maybe enough time has passed now. Enough time has passed from now to then where, you know, you know what they have done to hurt me, what I have done to hurt them. And it, enough time has passed, and you know, it may not be getting worse, like my feelings toward them or my bitterness may not be getting worse, so that's good, but I'll never be back to where I was before. God has no interest in just limiting the damage in your life. He looks at your sin, he looks at your flaws, he looks at your past and your future, he looks at you and he says, I can make your heart new again. I can make you new again. I can redeem this. But we can't come to God in our own way. We can't come to God and say, oh, God, I've done this for you. I've, I've lined up these items for you, I'm, or I'm important enough for you, uh, you know, so maybe you can do this. Or God, just, just wave your hand in front of me. Wave your hand, and you know, everything will be all set for the rest of my life, and everything's going to be great. God, can you just do that for me? Okay, great, thanks. I'm checking out. God, we cannot go to God in our own way, expecting him to do the things that we want him to do when we want it, what we want, how we want. God is trying to let us know is we need to experience surrender towards his will. In order to receive the power to experience, to see the display of his power in our lives, we need to be willing to surrender our hearts to the will of God. Because the need for his power is too great in our life. He's trying to tell us it requires you to dip in that dirty Jordan River. So what does that look like for us today? And I want you to know, Jesus is that Jordan River. He calls to you, and sometimes we think, if I just did enough good things, if I could just make my way to this point, even if I could just get better than where I was, then maybe I could come, I could come to Jesus, and then I could talk to him. And Jesus is trying to tell us, all you have to do is surrender your heart to me, and I can make all things new in your life.
He has no interest in just stopping the damage. He wants to redeem your life. But all we have to do to receive that power, to receive that grace, is to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, you can have my heart. You can have my life. I surrender to your will. I need your power. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't make my own way towards it, but I need it more than anything. Lord, have my heart. Jesus is that Jordan River. And only then can we see the true power of God begin to work in our lives when we surrender our will towards his will. Let's bow our head and and pray real quick. I think one of the things that people probably fear the most with this kind of stuff, and maybe it's true for some of you, maybe it's not. I think one of the things that some people fear is, you know, this sounds really good. This sounds really great, but you really don't know the things that I have done in my past. You really have no idea what I have done, what I have said to other people. You don't know the damage that I have caused with my actions. And so, yeah, this forgiveness thing, this grace thing, it sounds really good, but here's the thing. God would never accept me, so I at least got to make myself a little bit better before I could come to God. And God looks down and he says, you can't. You can't. If you surrender to his will, if you surrender to him, he makes all things new. He stops that damage, and he restores something inside of you. I feel like sometimes we think our sins are too great. What I love most about what Jesus did on the cross, Jesus went to the cross, and he died on that cross, and he didn't just take the sins of the world. He didn't just take our sins and our flaws. Hebrews says that he became our sin. He became our sin. If you struggle with lying to other people, he became a liar on the cross. If you struggle with anger, he became angry on the cross. If you struggle with lust, he became lustful on the cross. Jesus became those things on the cross. And then he died and he took those sins to the grave and he buried them and then he rose again and he became victorious of those sins. He defeated those sins and he says, I can give you my righteousness. I can replace that identity inside of you. I can make you new again, but only if you give me your heart. Because Jesus has no, no intentions of just stopping the damage in your life. He wants to make all things new in your life, but only when we surrender our hearts to the power of God will we see that displayed in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you died in our place, that you died to take our sins. God, thank you for giving us the freedom in knowing that we do not have to earn it. Thank you for taking that burden off of our shoulders, Lord. Give us the faith, give us the courage to go to you and surrender our hearts to you, God, because we need that power in our lives more than anything. Thank you for your goodness and your love that you don't turn us away, you don't disown us, but you accept us with loving arms and saying, I can make all things new. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Will you guys all just stand and join us in worship?